This morning, our keynote speaker is Julie Henry, presenting How to Be Resilient Through Scary Times. A little about Julie, she is a dedicated change maker and champion for wildlife and wild places. She inspires leaders to drive and survive change with lessons from the animal kingdom. She is a former zoo and aquarium senior leader, president of the Finish Line Leadership, and author of Wisdom from the Wild. So let's go ahead and welcome Julie, and then she will take questions at the end of her presentation. So let's give her a warm welcome, folks. Thank you. Well, good morning. Let's see, is this my mic working? I think it's on. All right. It's so good to be here with you. It's good to be here with you in person and to everybody in Zoom land. It's good to be with you, too. Um, I get to talk to you about one of my most favorite concepts, which is resilience, because it's so important, not only in the changes that you want to make for the environment and for our community, but also it's one of those things that, you know, I think a few years ago, we didn't talk about it the same way that we do now. Uh, you know, a few years ago, I would say, oh, yeah, no, I have a meeting, but really it was I have to pick my kids up from school. And now we just kind of let it all hang out. We're like, well, this is who I am, and I'm going to show up exactly how I'm meant to be. Uh, kind of like these birds. You know, one of my favorite things to do um, is when the skimmers are in town is to go for a run on the beach, right, and see the skimmers. Anybody else like to see the skimmers in town? Love the skimmers. Okay. How do we know which way the wind is blowing? <laughs> right? There are no odd birds standing the other way. Okay? So we know all of our birds are facing into the wind. They're facing down what's coming at them together. Right? Uh, but if we look at people, how do we know where their stress is? How do we know how they're being resilient? Can we see it on their faces? Maybe. Maybe they're working together. This is out in Seattle. A few years ago, I had the wonderful privilege to go out and help the Seattle Aquarium. They wanted to chart their next course as a conservation organization. So the first thing I said is, I mean, I really love, anybody been to the Seattle Aquarium out there? OK, really love the Seattle Aquarium. I really love any aquarium. Um, but you cannot always be creative where you work. Right? Anybody ever, when you try to have a meeting or like a visioning session and people are like, yeah, I know you're busy, but can I just message you something or instant message or all these things that we have now? Like, no, we need to be creative. Where can we go? Because we have really hard work to do, just like the hard work that you all have to do. These people represent not only the leadership of the aquarium, we have the CEO in here, we have the board chair. We have members from the community. We have high school teachers. We had people in this room who had never, ever been invited to the table to talk about conservation, even though it impacted them in where they lived. So if we're going to have a really hard meeting, we need to go someplace creative. So I said, where do you guys have? They said, well, we have Vulcan as a sponsor of ours. They have a room at the Seattle Seahawk Stadium. I said, done. We will go there. And so when we were able to sit in this space and have important conversations about where the future of conservation could go, at the, this was a two-day meeting. And I'll tell you, at the end of this meeting, on the first day, I had two 30-year employees come to me crying because they had never, ever had this opportunity to just talk about what their heart-centered work was about. And that was so reinforcing, not only to the people in the room, but because just like those birds facing into the wind, you need everybody together to work together for the big problems that we have. Because sometimes I feel like it's like this, right? When we're thinking about, <laughs> so we're a solution-oriented group. I love the fact that when they ask me to come and speak to you, I've been involved with this organization, this uh, workshop, for a long time. <laughs> For tw about 20 years ago, it was, my, I think, my first time that I was a part of this workshop, and that was back when I was running the Green Business Leadership Council of the Sarasota Chamber. And that was us, again, creating a space where we could talk about hard things. Because it feels like this to me. I don't know where we're going, but I'm pretty sure we need to go that direction. right? Uh, and sometimes it feels like this. This feels like change. right? Change is inevitable. It's what we need. Not only do you need to lead change, but it's inevitable. But do any of you get to that point when you're thinking about change and solutions, and I know you're positive and we need to keep going forward, but then you get to this point like, nope, I don't want to do it anymore. 
right? Or you facilitate that meeting and you get everybody in the room and, and you see this too. We've talked about that solution. I haven't seen it put into place. Those things are all possible and that's what's happening. And so in order to do that, we have to think about how people view the world. We have to think about how we have different lenses. I have two children. Can you tell that one of them is a rule follower when the suggested activity was to make a ladybug? One of them is not a rule follower. Okay, do I have some rule followers in the room? You will read the instructions. When I am reading the instructions, I read them again and again. When I am trying to cook, I am going back and I am back. It's really hard for me to get out of that left brain bullet uh, point mentality. So look at my daughter at five years old. Not only did she make the ladybug exactly the way it was supposed to be made, but the hearts are equidistant. The colors, that was not in the instructions, but she wanted to make the colors were balanced. And then I have my son who will always make anything a robot. <laughs> Anybody in the room, the robot builders? Right? You throw every, and thank God for you too. I'm so glad that all of us are in this room together and online because this is how we view the world. But what if we flipped it? What if we flipped it and thought about how does nature help us show up and lead? Because we learn so much from nature. We look to nature for inspiration. We look for art inspiration, architecture, medicine. We're trying to help and solve and and preserve nature, but nature can also help us lead. The very thing we're trying to do to nature, for nature, nature can help us. They can help us look for resilience. And when I think about resilience and nature, there's a poem by William Wordsworth called The Tables Turned, which says, up, up, my friend, and quit your books, or surely you'll grow double. Up, up, my friend, and clear your looks. Why all this toil and trouble? The sun above the mountain's head, a freshening luster mellow. Through all the long greens fields have spread his first sweet evening yellow. Books, tis a dull and endless strife. Come, hear the woodland linnet. How sweet his music on my life. There's more of wisdom in it. And hark, how blithe the throstle sings. He too is no mean preacher. Come forth into the light of things. Let nature be your teacher. So I want to show you a little clip of an interview I did recently with Roger German, who's the president and CEO of the Florida Aquarium, on his take on why leadership is inspired by wildlife and wild places. Oh, I went too fast. Did you see it? Was that good? <laughs> Hang on. Hi, I'm Julie Henry, President of Finish Line Leadership, and today I'm here at the Florida Aquarium with President and CEO Roger German to talk all things leadership, wildlife, and wild places. Roger, it is so awesome to be with you here at Florida Aquarium because, you know, we have a lot of shared history together. We both spent time at Shedd Aquarium, but there's no better place to talk about leadership and wildlife and wild places than uh, right here. So set the stage for us and why leadership, why, why wildlife and wild places? Well, Julie, welcome to the Florida Aquarium. And you're exactly right. Look, we, we're in this beautiful facility, 27 years old, and our mission and purpose is to make sure that we change the world that we save wildlife from extinction. And so when we talk about leadership, you know, I even go through my own journey. I remember going, talking to Ted Beatty, who was the president and CEO of the Shedd Aquarium. We know, you know Ted well. Yep. And it was about six or eight months when I started working at the Shed back in 2000. And I said, I want to be you someday. And he was like, oh, okay, so let's figure out this leadership journey. Yep. But the question was, why do you want to be me? And the first answer I had was, it's not about the title. It's about having an opportunity to be in a position to affect the most change from a wildlife standpoint, right, with a mission-based organization. And, and you can't do that without being in a leadership role in some ways. You can't do that without working with great colleagues, building that team that really truly will change the world. So I wanted to be a CEO for those reasons, not a title. I struggle sometimes with the title. Yeah. But how are you in a position to have the greatest influence on people, wildlife, and the mission? Yeah. So when people ask you, how would you define leadership? What do you answer? 
Well, one, I'll speak in, in full honesty is I'm still trying to figure it out. And I think that actually is a quality and a characteristic. I, I don't think leaders should know everything all the time. You surround yourself with good people. Continuously learn. We have a, a saying around here, Kaizen, so which is continuous improvement, right? So both organizationally, but continuous improvement as a leader. I think leaders who, uh, who, who are successful listen. I think leaders who are successful are transparent. Uh, I think leaders who are success successful understand an organization from top down. In many cases, that's like shadowing. That's, that's getting in there, right, and learning what everyone does, yeah. not just the, the fun things where, hey, can I hang out with Apopori today? And I, you know, check the box saying, I work with the animals. Right. You know, I'm out there taking tickets or yeah. I'm out there, you know, cleaning the restrooms. Because when you have to make decisions as a leader, you need to know the organization. You hear from people, uh, but you need to know it as well. So, I mean, I think those are characters. But you also have to be willing to make some tough decisions, and you have to be willing to set the vision, yeah. not manage every day, no. but set that vision and tone. So I think the, you know, I think those leaders are continuously improving. They're challenging themselves. Uh, they're listening, transparent, and and setting the tone. How how do those leadership skills show up? And what's unique about it? Like, how do you know that when you're listening to somebody talk, maybe on Capitol Hill, you're reading an article, you know that they've had some leadership development um, in a place like the Florida Aquarium or just in great mentors like yourself? Leadership to me in many ways is de facto. You have to listen to where people are at. Nine times out of 10, you have more commonalities than you think. So if you listen to them and you give them the value proposition, that to me is leadership and leading people to care for wildlife and leading people to care for those wild places. Because if you go in there and you're like this regularly, which a lot of us unfortunately do, and it, I understand, I think, I think that's just a disservice and you're never gonna move the needle in what our mission is and what your passion and my passion is. Yeah. Well, I really, really appreciate your openness, your your transparency, your vulnerability, and showing what it is to lead this organization, but also take leadership outside these walls, if you will, and in order to invite people in from so many facets of our community um, to not just learn about conservation, but to understand the inspiration that wildlife and wild places can have on their leadership journeys. And I think that's just yet one more way we can use our conservation Trojan horse to get our message um, out, and I just, I just thank you, and I'm, you know, I'm such a big fan of yours and champion. I can't wait to see all the great things you're going to continue to do with your team here. Well, you're very kind, but you're part of this journey with us too. So you can't run too far. Help us, help us achieve all the things that are passionate to us. So it's amazing when I sat down and talked with Roger, I've done the same thing with Dr. Crosby here at Moat Marine Laboratory, and talking with them and thinking about not only what is special about people who are connected to the environment and how we lead, but here's the other secret that I wanna let you in on. So when I mentioned my conservation Trojan horse, that's part of what I wanna help you think about today, is when you are talking to people in your realm of influence who don't necessarily share the same values as you or they don't see the way or reason we should convert, conserve nature the same way we do, if you can think about it and share with them the leadership lens as well, that's one more way that they can think about nature. And when I go in, I just, you know, a couple weeks ago, I was talking to a sports events and tourism association group. And when I'm gonna talk with them about sea cucumbers, which we're gonna talk about here in a minute, most people in the room didn't even know sea cucumbers were a thing, let alone an animal. So if they can walk away thinking about resilience, superheroes being sea cucumbers, which is what we're gonna do, was really trying to make the case that sea cucumbers would be a fabulous sports mascot. So we'll see if I can make that case to you today. But that's one more way, right? Because wisdom from the wild makes us think about the problems that we are facing through a more simple lens. That does not mean easy. We can put parameters, steps in place but it's not an easy road. We can think about how to create environments in which people feel safe to come together and have tough conversations, but not comfortable, because that's where the magic happens, right? How many times have you gone out into nature and be like, yep, I totally feel safe, but I am not comfortable, right? Whitewater rafting, jumping in a kayak, something like that. Every time you try something new, you can feel safe but not comfortable. That's how change happens. That's how we move the needle for climate solutions. And also thinking about significance, not title. Every one of you in here is significant in your realm of influence. It doesn't matter what your title is. 
Doesn't matter your years on the earth, your years of experience, et cetera. You have significance. How can you leverage that to conserve wildlife and wild places? Because we can learn so much, but sometimes people think about the obvious creatures. We call them the charismatic megafauna, if you will. We think about what can we learn from sharks? Or what can, how can we help save sharks? And I am a huge sharks fan, but I'm also a fan of these creatures. Now, do you see how I made that super small for anybody who's afraid of spiders in the room? Yeah, <laughs> I know. Because if my mom were in the room, she's like, Julie, stop it. All right? She could barely come over to my house last night for Halloween because we upped the ante with the spiders. But there, this is when I talk about what it's like to face fear. Fear is instinctual. When people are afraid to make change, it's not because they always don't want to make change. Sometimes they're just afraid of it. I love spiders. But when I have walked in my house, and there is a giant spider that's bigger than my hand next to my security code, I've walked back out. Just give the chance the spider to move on. I have not rehomed the spider. I've not done anything to the spider. But it, it's a gut reaction. That's what happens to us. OK, we learn from obvious creatures like lions, but what about pelicans? How can pelicans help us think about resilience in this case, because these are the three themes that nature teaches us about leadership, how to face change, because nature is all about change, right? How to work together in teams, but then most of all, how to be resilient, how to show up. Because there are things in nature that are always true. That gives me great comfort because my life sometimes feels a little topsy-turvy. And then when you're trying to go forward and make changes for the environment, Sometimes there are points at which things feel a little unstable. But when you think about it from the standpoint of an unbreakable law, we'll start here with sea cucumbers. See, aren't you convinced that this should be a sports mascot now? <laughs> right? Can't you see, like, woohoo? All right. So I'm going to tell you sea cucumbers are your resilience superhero. You are going to put an index card next to your mirror that says, I will channel my inner sea cucumber the next time I face adversity. Because here's the unbreakable law with sea cucumbers. When we talk about resilience, there's three points I want to give you to hold on to. And the first unbreakable law about resilience is this. You are wired to not just survive, but to thrive. Because what happens to sea cucumbers when predators come? They expel their organs. Is everybody done eating breakfast? <laughs> right? They literally eviscerate. It's a super fancy science word that means throw up their guts. This is mindset. In order to be resilient, you have to start with your mindset. Because if you go in with the mindset like, I don't know if I can make it. I don't know if I can face whatever I'm trying to face down. You will not make it to the other side. If that sea cucumber can throw up its guts, sea cucumbers are related to what animals? Starfish, sea stars. Yep, sea stars, you cut off an arm, what happens? It grows back. All right, so here comes this fish. It scares the sea cucumber. If the sea cucumber throws up its guts, the fish, if it doesn't just go away, if it actually eats the guts, the sea cucumber can grow more guts. How amazing is that? Literally, it can regrow its guts. It takes a couple days, but come on. That is amazing. Resilient sea cucumber, resilient superhero, sports mascot. OK? That is your mindset. I am wanting you to really channel. You are wired not just to survive, but to thrive with sea cucumbers. OK? So what about pelicans? What can they teach us when it comes to resilience? When it comes to leadership principles, how can you deal in? Here's your unbreakable law with pelicans. Resilience is instinct in action. All of you come built with resilience already ingrained in you. So I want you to think about it. If you are talking with a friend, a colleague, a family member of yours, and they are stressed, what do you recommend that they do? What do you recommend they do? Breathe. 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 OK, that's one thing. What else? Talk to somebody. Talk to, 
Yeah, talk to somebody, okay? How many of you might say, just walk outside, right? Breathe, walk outside, okay? How about take a bath? How about take a break? Turn off your phone? Stop. Okay, I'm going to give you an insight here. When you look at pelicans, pelicans, a long time ago I was in college and I, was, I needed to do a research study. I was in college in Ohio. My parents lived in Florida. So I'm like, well, I'm definitely doing research in Florida. Why am I going to, I love Ohio, don't get me wrong. But we came down and we went out to Siesta Beach and we brought those big spotting scopes. And my research project was studying the behavior pattern of pelicans because I wanted to see what happened. They come up, how long are they flying, they're diving, when are they successful, how long are they sitting. It was an ethogram. And that's exactly what I have people do when they're trying to figure out how to employ resilient strategies. Because nine times out of 10, we are not aware of where our resilient strategies even are employed during our day and what to do. Because I can't necessarily recommend something for you, but the, the trick is, the secret is, what you need for resilience is what you recommend to your friend to do. And it is not just self-care. Self-care is important, but I want to raise you up a level and think about resilience from an umbrella perspective. It's your energy management. Because pelicans, right, they hang out in the water, they fly up, fly, 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 see something they want to eat, they come down, not always successful, and then they sit, right, before they get going again. So think about your pattern. You prepare. You prepare for something. You prepare for a project, for a presentation, a community engagement seminar, what that, whatever that is. How many of you take as much time on the back end to not just rest, not just go outside, but also to reflect as you did to prepare? <laughs> not as many, right? Because we prepare, 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 and then what do we do? We check our phone. We see who emailed us. We go into that next conversation. We write that next grant, whatever that is. But the pelicans don't just keep flying. This is unbreakable law. Resilience is instinct and action. Your resilience strategies need to be a bell curve. Because if they're like this, eventually there is a cliff. And you know what the lovely thing about this is? You don't have to believe me. You can throw away everything I'm saying. The pelicans will still be pelicans. That's why they're unbreakable laws, because you can hold on to these truths. The last resilience strategy I want to give you is related to these animals. This is a picture of my desk, because I thought, well, I talk about this all the time. I teach this. I should actually uh, use my own strategies. <laughs> right? So I bought this picture of a cheetah, put it above my desk, because if you were to think about cheetahs, what do we think about cheetahs typically? How fast they go. How long can cheetahs run fast? Not long, short spurts, absolutely. But if you Google the word cheetah right now, we're going to pull up pictures that look like this, right? That's all we talk about, fastest land animal, the burst of speed, how they're built. I mean, that is amazing. Okay, so think about you in your daily lives, your leadership journeys, wherever you are. And if someone asks you how you're doing, you're either over here, oh my gosh, I am so busy. Really busy, a lot of stuff to do, a lot of passion-driven work, I have got to keep going. Or you might be over here, like, it's fine, it's all fine, totally fine. This is just as dangerous as this. False positivity is not resilience. Remember those birds steady into the wind? False positivity is not going to help you be resilient, but neither is just glorifying busyness all the time. Because when you think about cheetahs, and you think about how they interact, and they look super, this is a young boy out at Bush Gardens, and he was, hot, he was awesome, we were chatting, but usually cheetahs are like that. <laughs> right? Unless you have had the great fortune to go to Africa, one of the countries in Africa, and actually see cheetahs in the wild, chances are like me. And I've worked in zoos. And I still have only seen them running when they're interacting with their trainers or when they actually want something or when they're chasing something. 95% of the time, they're like this. And guess what they are not doing? They are not overthinking things. 
because what do we do? Yep, I am totally being resilient. I have, I have looked at my patterns. I need to fit it in my schedule. I have the mindset right. But then when I'm actually resting, I'm thinking about, gosh, I really wish I would have approached that meeting differently. I wish that interaction with the local official would have gone differently. I really should have sent that grant proposal into my partner earlier, right? We're thinking and thinking and thinking. Nope, the cheetah is like, I need to rest because here's your unbreakable law. Even cheetahs slow down. It doesn't matter if you don't employ resilience strategies or not. You, mind, body, and spirit, will employ them for yourselves. Rest in whatever that means for you from a resilience standpoint is going to happen whether you do it proactively or reactively. If you want to have the impact that you are designed to have in this community and beyond, you have got to employ resilient strategies because even she had to slow down. This is not when I can schedule it. This is not everybody else go home, I'll stay late. You teach people how to treat you. The more you set boundaries, the more you are giving permission for other people to set boundaries as well and to put their resilient strategies into play. Because here's your journey, right? When we think about sea turtles, the sea turtles that hatch on our beach who don't have any guidance, right? The mother sea turtle has come, she has gone back out to sea, and those hatchlings are going to create their own journey. When they go out to sea, when maybe one in 100 survive into adulthood, and then when they have to come back, when that female comes back to our beaches, she's migrating, right, to thousands of miles of the ocean. Can you imagine swimming through the water thousands of miles? No GPS, no friends to rely on. That's what the journey is we are on. We are thinking about solutions today, and I know that journey is exciting. It's filled with promise. It's filled with partners. It's also daunting. It's filled with sharks. Sharks can be good, too. Okay. But digging in and realizing and remembering that purpose on why you started down that journey in the first place Employing resilience strategies from your sea cucumbers, from your pelicans, and from your cheetahs will help you get back to where you want to be. So how do you be resilient in scary times? You seek out continually the wisdom from the wild. Because that's the place that you can't fool, right? Fake it until you make it doesn't always happen with nature. Like, I can't start climbing a mountain in these boots at 2 p.m. without my water and my food. I'm not going to make it. So coming to nature, nature will not ask you to be anybody other than who you are. But nature will always support you in that journey and provide you with wisdom in your resilience journey. So I hope as you continue along your journey and the impact that you want to have in the world, that you think about sea cucumbers, pelicans, and cheetahs. Because the animals and I are cheering you on. So thank you. All right, folks. So we're going to turn back to some questions now. So if, uh, if you haven't entered your question into Mentimeter, please do so now. And uh, we also passed out some uh, speaker cards to uh, take some questions from the audience as well, just in case folks are having a little difficulty with, uh, with Mentimeter still. So let's go, ahead and, uh, let's go ahead and get some questions. So, Julie, how do we foster leadership skills in youth? I mean, obviously, we want to get the next generation involved and, and keep that going. So how do we do mm -hmm. that? That's a really good question. I really appreciate that question. Um, I would say that the first thing we do is talk to them like the leaders that they are already. 
Um, we've got to create environments in which they can come together and talk about their challenges and their unique perspective on the world, because it's not how I see the world. It's not how we see the world. So we've got to talk to them as leaders already. Um, we've got to not shy away from the truth and the hard things, because if we need to get people together to make tough decisions and have conversations, it's uncomfortable. And we have to put youth in situations in which they feel safe, but not comfortable to have hard conversations. Um, and then I think the third thing is there's a, I just worked with a, um, the Sarasota Chamber has a, a youth leadership program. I just worked with them a few weeks ago. And what was super inspiring to me was thinking about personal branding of leadership. Like when people walk in the room, how do you know that they are the leader? And it's not because they lead with their title. So thinking about and helping youth realize how they show up in the world as their whole selves, but as a leader, um, will help them as they try to message and have the impact that they're designed to have. All right, well, what's the, what's the next question for Julie? All right, so if mm. we were listening to nature in terms of climate change, what would it be telling us right now? <laughs> <laughs> Stop it, stop doing what you're doing to the world. Um, I mean, yeah, if we were listening to nature in terms of climate change, we would be uh, working together, I think, even faster than we are, uh, not, not, um, I mean, everybody in this room is, is a converted soul from the standpoint of like, we know we have to keep going. Uh, but nature just does. Like there's a, there's a rock, the river goes around it, eventually it erodes through it, but we're not always trying to, not everybody's gonna be on the same page with us about if, even if climate change exists, right? So trying to figure out how we get that behavior change as the ultimate goal without always the value shift is to me like the water going around the boulder and eventually it erodes away but the water just needs to keep going. We need to make change for climate change now. Um, and if everybody agrees with us, fine, but we just need them to change their behavior. Yeah, thank you. What do we got next for Julie? Okay, so what is the <laughs> lesson from the wild of the tarantula? <laughs> uh, <laughs> the lesson is that no matter, like I, like I said, I love spiders. My mom, oh my gosh, she'd be like, she, I don't think she, she could even read this question. She'd be freaked, freaked out. Um, but tarantulas exist. They have a unique niche in the world, just like um, all of us have a unique niche in the world. So to appreciate people that might scare us at first, quite uh, honestly. Um, but it goes back, for me, it goes back to fear of change because um, I've, I've held tarantulas, I, I've, I've worked with them. And even when I've been holding a tarantula and she's cleaned her little tarantula sitting on my hand, I've been like, I'm not scared, I'm not scared. Um, it's facing change head on, which is what the tarantula helps us do. All right, so we got a question here from the audience. Um, what do we do to deal with climate change deniers? Mm. <laughs> um, well, so, so, you know, it depends on the data that you're looking at. Um, I think we need to uh, just resolve ourselves to, and there will always be climate change deniers, always. Usually it's like 10%, depends on the data you're looking and the topic you're thinking about. But again, the, if our goal, you know, there's the, the movable mill, right? There's the cl climate change deniers, there's the people who are already in the choir, if you will, and then there's the movable middle. The movable middle is a larger percentage. And so we need these folks to keep going with us and making changes. The climate deniers will exist. Sometimes they're loud. Sometimes they're giant boulders in the river, so that's difficult. Um, but again, going back to do they need to not deny? Well, that would be great. I would prefer that everybody personally, um, agrees about climate change, but that's, the reality is not gonna happen. So um, how do we work with the movable middle and then get the climate deniers um, either to make behavior changes or to at least not be impediments in the road? All right, that's good information. So uh, what is your favorite animal lesson? <laughs> um, my favorite animal lesson is from animals that are um, sometimes overlooked. Um, so that's why I talk about sea cucumbers. I also talk about naked mole rats a lot because just like um, people sometimes get assumed to be not leaders or assumed to not be, maybe not a value, but not be um, as influential as they could be. I, I like to th think about animals that, uh, you know, people don't even think sea cucumbers are an animal, let alone what we learn from them. So I want to raise animals up just like raising animal uh, people up because uh, that's... Um, a lot of people already value sharks and dolphins, and that's awesome. Right. So they don't need my voice. Uh, the lesser-known animals need my voice. So just keep an open mind and, uh, and, and just keep moving forward with anything that you want to learn in, in terms of animals go. Yeah, like take, take the second look. Like go to the exhibits in the zoo or stop when you're snorkeling and consider what, uh, what you can find under that rock that you might have not stopped at before. Okay. So uh, next for you is um, 
Animals seem to be opportunistic. How can we keep people's attention on our environment and the whole of all of us instead of themselves mm. or their own immediate gratification? Mm. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really interesting interesting question. I think um, the idea that animals don't it's like it's like when we try to like work with a species that is endangered in the uh, in the wild, but then we don't protect its habitat. Like, well, where are we going to put it back into, right? Or or we we think about animals and then the introduced species that interact with us. Um, you can't think about these things as individual units. They're all con you know, connected. Um, so when it's focusing on the environment and the whole of all of us, I love themselves. I mean, there's a little bit that's, that's gonna be hard to change because it's what's right in front of us. Um, but it, the more you can get people to step back and say, well, what if, and let me just think about people from other perspectives, I think that would help. So that goes back a little bit then to the climate change deniers, really helping those folks, even if they aren't willing at this point to make those changes or to accept that thought process, you just kind of keep going. Yeah, keep going. Everybody, everybody's value systems has different angles. So if you can find the value that gets you to the end point, it's like, it's like trying to get healthy. Like some people wanted to, do, to lose weight, some people want to run a marathon, some people want to just grow mo more kale in their backyard. The outcome is still the same, I'm healthy. I just have to find <laughs> the angle. All right, so this uh, came from the audience, of course, just now. What do we do with the recent news that we are beyond the turning point of climate change? Oh. That's a very heavy question. Yeah, I mean, that's, um, well, we can sit with it. I would say, like, we sit with it for a minute and just um, realize, and then, and then realize that I think it's the same, in my mind, it's the same thing. Like, every generation is like, gosh, there's so many problems. Like, well, there are, but what's the, op what are we going to do? Like, well, <laughs> forget it. I'm just going to sit down and, like, that's not an option. Right. So it is heavy. And then we resolve to be resilient, be together, find our allies, and continue that conversation because we have no alternative. We can't stop. Um, so with that news, I would just compartmentalize it, quite honestly, and then just figure out what motivates me. Well, we're going to go ahead and jump back to a couple uh, Mentimeter questions, but if any of you folks have uh, some questions written down, feel free to bring them on up, and we'll, uh, and we'll provide them to Julie. So next question is, how do you define a leader? Everyone can learn from these lessons, correct? Yes. Absolutely. That's so. Two things here. I love these questions. You guys are awesome. I, really, I appreciate all these questions. Um, how do you define a leader? A person who leads change. Like, if you're not leading change, what are you doing? I mean, I don't care if you lead a company, lead a community, lead a family, or lead yourself. Like, no leader just. I, I'm totally happy with the status quo. Really? Then you're not leading. <laughs> Okay, and everyone can learn from these lessons. That's why I use animals. It levels the playing field. I mean, you could have a Harvard MBA, and I could have not graduated from middle school, and I could be from <laughs> Oklahoma, and you could be from Tokyo. But if we talk about cheetahs. Common ground. Yeah, it's common ground. And that's when we talk about climate change, we have to invite people in. And I think animals invite people in about leadership because it makes it accessible and equitable. Well, I definitely don't have an MBA, but I appreciate it. <laughs> um, okay, so the next question for you. Awesome presentation. That's fantastic. Can you share an example of a project that you are currently working on that is having a positive impact? Oh, that, I, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, the project I'm, I, I would say is that, it goes back to the first question about um, youth, is that I'm finding these lessons are being picked up by um, people I didn't expect to be picked up. So um, high school students, college students, and that's encouraging me because I think we look at leadership as an end point. We have arrived. I am a leader. Like, nope. Leaders are an ellipses. You're always changing. <laughs> so if we can start those conversations early, that inspires me um, because I can get in there and start noodling uh, with them um, in order. So because we, it takes all of us in this room, and and also it's the conservation Trojan horse. It's it's uh, that excites me. That um, I don't know. If, if you didn't know what a naked mole rat is before, you do now. And and the engineers in Oklahoma know because I talked to them about it. So that's exciting. Well, it has a cool name, that's for sure. <laughs> um, okay, so what animal group dynamics can we apply to our teams at work? Mm. Which is a great question. So my favorite thing to talk about this is when you think about coral reefs, and if I were to ask you about coral reefs, you know, we always think about the big, again, charismatic megafauna, like even the squirrel fish and the lobsters and the tube worms and all the ones that get our attention. But the largest, most critical animal in a coral reef is coral. coral. <laughs> Okay, so when you are at work, who are the people, or even the processes, but more importantly, who are the people that get overlooked? 
or not given their due, that without them, the entire organization starts to fall away. And that's super important because if we ignore that in coral reefs, we know what happens. If we ignore that in our businesses, the same thing will happen. All right, what's the next question for Julie? Okay, so how do animals handle disasters like Ian? Uh, how do we learn from that? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. When I, my parents had to evacuate to my house and when they came over, I was saying to them like, listen, there are no birds, <laughs> right? It's like the birds had already left. In fact, one of my friends had to put their bird feeder back out because the birds were waiting um, to literally fuel up. So they did, they birds fuel up and then they left. Um, so they know, right, on some sense that it's coming. Uh, so how do we learn from that? I think we, we go back and we dial in and we just watch as much as we can um, how they're interacting and what they're doing and, um, and then lean in. It's, that's hard, uh, but, but they left. <laughs> not that we always right. leave, that's not what I'm saying, but they... <laughs> they know, they know. I don't want to go, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so how do you foster a motivated, creative, and progressive work environment when so many are exhausted and working to survive, if not thrive, especially coming out of Hurricane Ian? Yeah, you know, so there's, there's passion tax, right? Like, and, and I call it compassion tax as well. Like, just because you love what you're doing does not mean you need to work yourself to the bone. And again, it doesn't matter if you're volunteering or you're paid to do what you're doing. Um, we work and we work and we work. And if you don't take your resilience seriously, you cannot show up and do what you're supposed to do. And if you are working yourself to the bone, so are the people around you by default um, because you influence more people than you actually realize. Um, so fostering a motive, creative, and progressive work environment is one in which you say, we need to be resilient. We need to talk about when things are stressful and make it safe but not comfortable in order to do that. All right, so what else we got for Julie? Um, why did you call them unbreakable laws? I think that's a great question. Yeah, because, um, because it's, well, it's like gravity, right? Like gravity exists. <laughs> and so, you know, you, I have this crazy plant at home and apparently the sun was that way because now it's growing like this. <laughs> and so, so they're unbreakable laws because they're always true. Like, Cheetahs will not run forever. They just won't. And so when I teach about leadership or change and resilience, if I, again, you don't have to listen to me. Watch the cheetahs. <laughs> so it's an unbreakable law. And that, I think, helps people, um, you know, hold on to that mm -hmm. and, and uh, not argue with me. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, it's like I didn't just invent the top ten ways to be resilient or the, that, pff, no. Like, I just looked at the animals. Like, let me just give you a lens. And that's the lens. All right, so um, we got a couple more. Got time for a couple more. So, what is your message for the young people in attendance, especially that young baby right over there? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I was going to take that baby up here. Like, <laughs> um, the message for the young people in attendance is: is we need you. Um, you know, come with us because your perspective is invaluable, and the people that you can reach, it's, it's communication 101. So the people that you can reach are not the people I can reach. And the way that you're going to approach solving problems is a different than I, the way I approach solving problems. Um, and so, it, again, it doesn't matter how many years you have been on this earth. You have a perspective to share. You have an influence to make. And we need, it takes everybody. All right. Well, thank you so much. Absolutely. Let's give Thank Julie you. a nice round of applause. That's I'll fantastic information. <laughs>